So here we have a 4-bit adding machine implemented in Civilization 3 using barbarians and workers. At the beginning, we have yellow plains tiles representing the input, and at the end, we have green grassland tiles representing the output. The yellow plains tiles are divided into two columns of 4 bits each, where the least significant bit is at the top and the most significant is at the bottom. So this is a 1 bit, a 2, a 4, and an 8. If a barbarian occupies the bit, its value is set to 1. We can remove the barbarian from the tile to set its value to 0. Now this column contains a 1, a 2, and an 8, making its value 11. We'll do the same for this column, removing two of the barbarians, to set its value to 10. Now, with an input of 10 and an input 11, the output over here should be 21, giving us a value of 1 set in the 16th place, the 4th place, and the 1 place. We can run the circuit by pressing enter repeatedly. This will take some time, so I will fast forward the video. And now at the end, we can see that the value was successfully achieved. The 16th place is set to 1, the 4th place is set to 1, and the 1th place is set to 1, giving us a total value of 21, the correct addition answer. To understand how this circuit works, we need to take a look at how movement works in Civilization 3. Civilization 3 operates on an isometric grid, which means that on any given tile you can move in 8 different directions. North, northwest, west, and so on, all the way around. Barbarians operate under these principles too but they also seek to capture and destroy workers. However, the order in which they capture workers is not random. This barbarian is surrounded on all eight sides by workers, but the worker that he will choose to capture will always be the northeastern worker. Barbarians that are adjacent to workers have a set movement priority. Their highest priority is to move to the northeast, the next highest priority to the east, then the southeast, and all the way around in a clockwise direction. So if we move the northeastern worker out of the way, the eastern worker out of the way, and the southeastern worker out of the way, I can guarantee that the barbarian will capture to the south. When a barbarian is not adjacent to any unit, it will stay fortified, with one exception. If a unit occupies the northwestern southeastern diagonal that the barbarian lies on, the barbarian will then seek out to capture the unit. However, as soon as the unit moves off this diagonal, the barbarian will go back to being fortified. Here, the yellow plains tiles represent the domain of the barbarian. If a unit is within these plains tiles, the barbarian will seek to capture the unit. The yellow plains tiles extend out for 13 units in both the northwestern and southeastern direction. So a unit within this zone will become the target of the barbarian, even if there is a closer unit nearby. Along the diagonals, barbarians will seek out to capture the unit that it can get to the quickest, but this isn't always intuitive. In this instance, the worker on the northwest is only four tiles away from the barbarian, much closer than the worker to the southeast. However, because of the rail system, the barbarian can actually reach the unit in the southeast faster, and so that is the direction in which it travels. Another concept to understand is barbarian independence. Barbarians act independently of each other. In this case, both barbarians are closer to the northwest worker. However, this top barbarian will surely reach the worker first. So it might be intuitive to expect this barbarian to track the southeastern worker instead. But in fact, they both move northwest. Though barbarians can't affect each other directly, they can indirectly. In this case, both barbarians, based on the priority system, want to capture the center worker. However, whichever barbarian captures it first will force the other barbarian to move in the other direction. Let's say this barbarian captures the worker, it will force this barbarian to move up instead of the direction it initially wanted to. If this barbarian captures it first, this barbarian will be forced southwest. With an understanding of these barbarian movement patterns, we can now begin to build logic gates. This is an OR gate, again with the yellow plains tiles representing the input and the green grassland tile representing the output. Here we have an OR gate with the two zeros set, a zero and a one, a one and a zero, and two ones. If we run the OR gate, we can see the results. In the three instances where at least one barbarian was present, one barbarian made it to the end. In this instant, where two barbarians were present, the extra barbarian was sent into the city, where it was destroyed. Cities act as a trash can for extra barbarians, and are useful to get rid of them when they are no longer needed. Here we have an AND gate, with a time of 4 ticks. At the end of 4 ticks, the only final square that should be occupied is this one, where both barbarians initially are present. 
and we can see that result was achieved, with the excess barbarians being dumped into their various cities. Here we have an XOR gate. An XOR gate will produce a result of 1 only if there is one and only one input. This particular gate is 14 ticks long, which means it takes 14 ticks for the input to reach the output. Now that we have logic gates, we can construct a half adder. This half adder introduces two new concepts, the first one being barbarian duplication. Sometimes, in a circuit, one input needs to go in two different directions. This mechanism allows one barbarian to become two. When this barbarian circuit reaches the mountain tile, it will force this automated worker to flee towards the city. Now, in this case, the worker is a mounted unit, so the worker cannot cross mountain tiles, so it will take an elongated path to reach the city. On this path, it will be put into the sights of this barbarian along its northwestern vision. This barbarian will then join the mountain barbarian, and the circuit will be duplicated. Another new concept is that of signals crossing each other. In this case, this bottom signal needs to end up on top, and this top signal on bottom. This mechanism allows signals to cross over each other without interfering. Now, this half adder works, but it's unnecessarily complicated, verbose, and contains one too many instances of phallic imagery. This is in part because it is skeuomorphic to the original design of a half adder, but we can do better using the constraints of Civilization 3. Here is a half adder reduced down to just 7 ticks. We can run the half adder to see the successful results. The half adder produced a result of 0 and 1, with a significant digit on bottom, which is a correct result of 2, equaling 1 plus 1. Here we have a full adder, which takes in 3 inputs and produces 2 outputs. The full adder itself is comprised of 2 half adders located here and here, and 1 OR gate. Running the half adder with 3 inputs activated, should produce two inputs at the end, representing a three. Now we can return to the four-bit adder, which as we can see is comprised of seven half adders, located here, 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 and here, as well as three OR gates, located here, here, and here. The half adders compact quite well. The only modification needed to be done to them was adding a two-rail system here, so that the barbarians correctly dispose of themselves in the correct cities. If you're interested in trying these circuits out for yourself and messing around with them, I've included a link in the description to my website, which hosts a catalog of all the circuits I've created. Also in the description is a link to the Civilization 3 subreddit, r slash civ3, which I highly recommend if you have any interest in the game. I hope you found this video entertaining, and take care.